Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. A major release of the GIMP is on its way and you can preview it now. Work is beginning on what is thought to be the world's first major plant to store energy in the form of liquid air. Hyperloop has carried its first set of passengers. Microsoft Teams users are under active attack. And Tim Berners-Lee hopes to improve the privacy of the internet with his new company. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. A new development version of the GNU Image Manipulation Program is available for testing, and get ready, it's a game changer. GIMP 2.99.2 may be considered unstable, but it's a huge step towards the long-anticipated GIMP 3.0 release, which promises to be the most significant release of the free image editing tool to date. GIMP 3.0 will be based on the GTK3 UI toolkit, which will bring many improvements over the current GTK2 that GIMP currently uses. GIMP 3.0 and the 2.99.2 preview for that matter include multi-layer selection and support for applying changes to multiple layers at a time. It also promises to deliver a faster, more responsive user experience, leveraging render caching within the interface. GIMP 2.99.2 is an unstable release. That means it's intended for developers, bug hunters, and enthusiasts only, and is not recommended for production use. Some of the features on the roadmap are a work in progress, so there are bound to be many bugs throughout. That said, you can download GIMP 2.992 um, now if you'd like to take it for a spin. Windows users can get it on the GIMP developer download page, and Linux users can grab it through a flat pack on Flathub's beta channel. There's also a continuous build app image on the official GIMP GitHub repository. Sorry, Mac users, it's not ready for testing on Mac OS just yet. There isn't a firm release date for GIMP 3.0, but the devs hope to have it ready for release sometime in 2021. Work is beginning on what is thought to be the world's first major plant to store energy in the form of liquid air. It will use surplus electricity from wind farms at night to compress air so hard that it becomes a liquid at minus 196 Celsius. Then, when there is a peak in demand in a day or a month, the liquid air will be warmed so it expands. The resulting rush of air will drive a turbine to make electricity, which can be sold back to the grid. The system was devised by Peter Dearman, a self-taught backyard inventor from Herefordshire, and it has been taken to commercial, com commercial scale with a £10 million grant from the UK government. Dr. Dearman said his or Mr. Dearman said his inv invention was 60 to 70 percent efficient depending on how it is used. That is less efficient than batteries, but he said the advantage of liquid air is the low cost of the storage tanks, so it can be easily scaled up. Also, unlike batteries, liquid air storage does not create a demand for minerals, which may become increasingly scarce as the world moves towards power systems based on variable renewable electricity. Batteries are really great for short-term storage, Mr. Dearman said, but they are too expensive to do long-term energy storage. That's where liquid air comes in. Mr. Dearman had been developing a car run on similar principles with liquid hydrogen when he saw the potential for applying the technology to electricity storage. He is now a passive shareholder in Highview, one of the firms building the 50-megawatt plant. The 50-megawatt facility near Manchester will store enough energy to power around 50,000 homes for up to five hours. That is really amazing. Just to think that a few thousand years ago, we were taking buckets of water up a hill to store them and then use that water were as we? energy. We were. I remember. Oh, yeah. I know. Just back in the day, right? Just getting like <laughs> coffees and everything. No, oh, yeah. but it's, it's remarkable in the sense that we're able to use this natural thing that we breathe every day yeah. and use that to store energy. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Talking about a green energy source. What a clever idea. But uh, like how much pressure is oh, this <laughs> thing under? <laughs> More than me whenever I had work, but still. Oh, boy. Um, no, but it's, it's a remarkable idea. And the, I really like how they really focused on the idea of green energy because, again, yeah. unlike batteries where you have to have all these minerals, everything else dug up, mm -hmm. you're able to use this 
it's it's just air. It's it's and, under compression and it's able to store energy. Yes, and thinking of batteries, not only do you have to obtain the resources, but mm -hmm. When those are depleted, when they're no longer able to hold exactly a the waste, everything else. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's exactly right. One less thing to worry about, and it, it's just amazing these technologies. And I'd, I'm curious to see what they think of next. Mm -hmm. I, I love the idea of uh, an energy source that is able to kind of recycle itself. Yes, and that's kind of what this reminds me of. I've thought about, and I know it's not practical, and I know that it's probably not even possible. But yeah. um, putting, like, uh, you know, you know, in a water source, something that can pump the water because it's yeah. and and generate electricity at the same time. There's so many neat ideas out there. There, there but this are. is something that's actually coming to pass. Well, that this is the number one thing because with in respect to green technology. The big, the largest thing that's been lagging behind is definitely being able to store that energy. Because again, yeah. we do have these advances in solar power, wind power, but mm -hmm. the issue is where do you store all where that energy? Where do you energy? put it? Yeah. So this can definitely be one of those solutions that can help us help turn our economy, our world into a more greener place cool. down the road. So this, this is really, really cool to hear. Can't wait to see what comes of it. Yeah. Or hears of it. Or smells of it. I, I'm trying to think of air puns, but it's not working. <laughs> So <laughs> we tried. Oof. Virgin Hyperloop has trialed its first ever journey with passengers in the desert of Nevada. The futuristic transport concept involves pods inside vacuum tubes carrying passengers at high speeds. In the trial, two passengers, both company staff, traveled the length of a 500 meter test track in 15 seconds, reaching 172 kilometers an hour. You may recall from our past coverage as far as 2018 that the top speed for the Hyperloop is said to be a thousand kilometers an hour. And while this is only a fraction of that ambition, it's a big step toward Hyperloop transportation becoming a reality. Virgin Hyperloop is not the only firm developing the concept, but nobody has carried passengers before. Sarah Lucian, director of customer experience, was one of the two on board and described the experience as exhilarating both psychologically and physically. She and Chief Technology Officer J Josh Geigel wore normal clothing rather than flight suits for the event, which took place on Sunday afternoon outside of Las Vegas. Ms. Lucian said the journey was smooth and not at all like a roller coaster, although the acceleration was zippier than it would be with a longer track. Neither of them felt sick, she added. She said that their speed was hampered by the length of the track and acceleration required. The concept, which has spent years in development, builds on a proposal by Tesla founder Elon Musk. Some critics have described it as science fiction. It is based on the world's fastest magnetic levitation trains, then made faster by placing the train inside vacuum tubes. The world record speed for a maglev train was set in 2015 when a Japanese train reached 374 miles per hour in a test run near Mount Fuji. The Hyperloop has already exceeded that speed, but never with passengers. Critics have pointed out that Hyperloop travel systems would involve the considerable undertaking of both getting planning permission and then constructing vast networks of tubes for every travel path. Ms. Lucian acknowledges the potential difficulties, saying, of course there's a lot of infrastructure to be built, but I think we've mitigated a lot of risk that people didn't think was possible. In speaking about the infrastructure challenges, she pointed out that while governments can continue building up yesterday's transport systems, people are looking for new solutions, the transportation of the future. Microsoft Teams users are under active attack, and Tim Berners-Lee hopes to improve the privacy of the internet at large with his new company. Becca has these stories coming up, plus Robert is here with the Crypto Corner, so don't go anywhere. back to the world of cryptos and welcome back to the Crypto Corner. Today we're going to spend some time in Ethereum 2.0. I'm going to explain to you in a very simple way what Ethereum 2.0 is all about. And to start we're going to look at the fees. So the fees that you pay when you do a transaction on the Ethereum blockchain. And this year is 2018. In 2018 the fees were fairly low and then suddenly a project was started called CryptoKitties Everybody complained about it because the fees went absolutely through the roof. Now that was 2018. How does that same picture look today? 
if I expand this here to today, then here, this is the little blip with CryptoKitties. The fees that we had to pay because of DeFi not so long ago were significantly higher. And if you consider that we are, how many people are we using the Ethereum blockchain? Let's say 100,000, 200,000, it won't be much more than that. So if 200,000 can already um, bring the blockchain uh, in regards to fees to a halt, how would that look like if we have got suddenly 20 million people using this chain? It will not be uh, feasible any longer. And that's why, um, including also some other reasons, a long time ago, the idea of Ethereum 2.0 was started and it taking its, it's taking its time. And why? Because coding and programming is not simple. Yeah. If you have got a company like Apple or Google where everything is under one roof, everything is coordinated in a different way. Uh, you can have a different type of transparency and, uh, and also objectives. But if you have got a team of 400 people that are coordinated through something like GitHub, yeah, so this GitHub is where everything happens in regards to Ethereum, then it looks very, it's very complex. And so everything has to be done very meticulously um, because we're talking about money here in this case. Um, money transfer. So big mistakes will cost a lot of money as we've seen in DeFi. And we've got over in the Ethereum current blockchain, we've got over 244 repositories, over 500 people uh, programming. Uh, so you can imagine how complex this whole thing is. Yeah, there are many hundred thousand lines of code that need to be coordinated. That's why this thing takes so long. Now, looking at the roadmap, um, this is the roadmap of the of ETH 2.0. So this is the current chain here. So this is ETH 1.0. That's the Ethereum you and I know. And soon we will have the beacon chain, which is the start of Ethereum 2.0. And <clears throat> this year is like the current chain without proof of work, so proof of stake, and you will not have any smart contracts in this uh, phase zero. From there, we will start with a with a, uh, smart contracts, but we'll have shards. And shards are like, just imagine it in a very simple way, like sub blockchain. So you'll have a chain for, let's say, um, in DeFi, you'll have a chain that's uh, that needs to be secured in a special way. Then you've got a, a chain for uh, gamers. So when something happens like uh, with CryptoKitties, where suddenly the chain was blocked, it will be only that chain that will be blocked at that time and the fees will not go through the roof. So there are lots of little improvements coming also along uh, with this ETH uh, 2.0. And the roadmap in detail, this is the one, so we're here today, and we will start soon uh, phase zero. Uh, phase zero means um, moving away from proof of work to proof of stake, and that's done by having a deposit contract because you need to secure the network, not through miners, so people, that are mining, you need to secure it through value. And um, that, for that, the deposit contract was now uh, created. And the time is running now until the 7th of December, where then the beacon chain will be started. From there, we will then go over to phase zero and then much later phase two and phase three. And at this stage here, there will be also no more proof of work. So the current blockchain that you know ETH.0 will be more or less switched off. That's not possible, I know, but it, it will not continue. Everything will happen in the new uh, Ethereum 2.0. And um, for the tr transition from the current status to ETH.0, uh, phase zero, they created a very good website, launchpad.ethereum.org, where when you want to become a validator, <laughs> you can get started here and they'll run you through some questions and so on, and they explain to you what that really means, um, you will get some money. So for every Ethereum that you uh, stake, uh, so in other words, you put up at security, you'll get some uh, money as, as a reward. At the beginning, it will be, of course, higher because we're starting, but and over the time, it will go down. And uh, here, this is the status of how far people have committed already to this uh, new uh, chain where at 10%, I guess that around the 1st of December, this thing should be filled more or less because all the big whales will be coming in um, into uh, staking because get, the rewards are not bad at the beginning. So this is um, 
Ethereum 1.0 explained, uh, 2.0, sorry, explained in a very simple way. And I hope you liked it and I hope you enjoyed it. And I thank you very much for watching and I'm looking forward to see you next week again. So thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder that we're not providing financial advice, but only sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. Always remember that the cryptocurrency market is always changing and always volatile. So only invest what you can afford to lose. And now here's Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Microsoft Teams users are under active attack in a fake updates malware campaign. Attackers are using ads for fake Microsoft Teams updates to deploy backdoors, which use Cobalt Strike to infect companies' networks with malware. Microsoft is warning the customers about the so-called fake updates campaigns in a non-public security advisory revealed by Bleeping Computer. The campaign is targeting various types of companies with recent targets in the K-12 education sector, where organizations are currently dependent on using apps like Teams for video conferencing due to COVID-19 restrictions. Cobalt Strike is a commodity attack simulation tool that's used by attackers to spread malware, particularly ransomware. Recently, threat actors were seen using Cobalt Strike in attacks exploiting Zero Logon, a privilege elevation flaw that allows attackers to access a domain controller and completely compromise all Active Directory identity, identity services. In the advisory, Microsoft said it's seen attackers in the latest fake updates campaign using search engine ads to push top results for team software to a domain controlled by the attackers and used for nefarious activity. If victims click on the link, it downloads a payload that executes a PowerShell script which loads malicious content. Cobalt Strike beacons are among the payloads also being distributed by the campaign, which give threat actors the capability to move laterally across a network beyond the initial system of infection. The link also installs a valid copy of Microsoft Teams on the system to appear legitimate and avoid alerting victims to the, to the attack. Malware being distributed by the campaign include Predator the Thief, InfoStealer, which pilfers sensitive data such as credentials, browser, and payment data. Microsoft also has seen a backdoor and Zloader stealer being distributed by the latest campaigns. Microsoft is recommending that people use web browsers that can filter and block malicious websites and ensure that local admin passwords are strong and can't easily be guessed. Admin privileges also should be limited to essential users and avoid domain-wide service, domain service accounts that have the same permissions as an administrator, according to the report. They advise organizations to limit their attack surface to keep attackers at bay by blocking executable files that do not meet specific criteria or blocking JavaScript and VBScript code from downloading executable content. Well, at Microsoft Teams, it takes a team to be hacked. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's... You can get independently hacked very easily. Yeah, well, no, it's, it's, it's a scary thing, really, because with it being seen so much, not just organizations, but if you're an educator, if you're a teacher, yeah. student, etc., um, and it, it isn't... Uh, well, think you, you're talking about teachers and stuff. I'm thinking about how these folks have been thrown into having to use Microsoft Teams. With no experience. This is something totally new. And then all of a sudden, you get a little little window that says, hey, you need to update. It's okay. This right. is safe. And you think, oh, well, this, this is what I'm using for my classroom, so I better get yeah. that update. So, oh, no. It's like, Children, make sure you install this update. Well, like, like <laughs> oh, we, were, no. we were just talking before the show, it really is a form of social engineering. Right? Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's so easy to fall into the trap. And this is where phishing scams have, like, we think, oh, well, I would never fall for a phishing scam because, you know, I don't use that service or this service or whatever. But it's a, it's a, like, a, if I throw enough phishing scams out there that pretend to be the Royal Bank of Canada, yeah. I will inevitably land in the inbox of some people who yes. bank at the Royal Bank of Canada. So if I buy ads that are pretending to be updates for Microsoft Teams, even though I personally, Robbie Ferguson, don't use Teams. Somebody out there. You might. Yep, somebody else yeah. might. And and social engineering, they they trick those folks into installing this malware. And we're talking ransomware. Mm -hmm. So ransomware is the one that encrypts your files and goes out on the network that you're connected to and encrypts all the files that it can gain access to. And as yeah. we know from zero logon, that is every 
file on the entire network. If you're like like a school network, you think, oh well, we're locked down, it's safe. <laughs> uh, no, zero login, uh, zero logon allows them to have administrator credentials just, just like your I, just like your IT admin. So like these are serious exploits, mm -hmm. and social engineering they're using that to get into these systems that could be a backdoor into the network. Well, exactly. Like, I, I'm also scared for small businesses, right? Yeah. So again. Everyone's working from home now. So yep. again, if you have employees who aren't as tech literate or But Henry, <sighs> who would target me? I'm just a <laughs> I'm just a work from home, you know, person who you no know, nobody would Solves. ever target me. See, yeah, false sense of security, right? Yeah, so. we become complacent, absolutely. Yeah. But the fact is, is that these are non-targeted attacks. Mm -hmm. These tools are built to find susceptible systems yeah. and attack them. Yeah, just a wide net. That's all it takes. Mm -hmm. Like you said, one email, spam it out. Yeah, so maybe a pie hole, which is an ad blocking DNS mm, server, no. suddenly becomes not just something to block your advertising, but also something to, like your ad blocker becomes something that's going to prevent malware. Yeah. They bought ads on Google. I mean, like. Come on. I've seen it happen on Facebook. I've been on yeah, Facebook. Yeah, I and a Java, uh, I think it was a flash virus at the time, tried to install through an ad. Well, they have like a $100 free like ad credit thing if you sign yeah. up for Google Ads now. So they got right. a real good deal. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that's <laughs> not sponsored. So be really careful what yeah. you click on, folks. Be very, very careful and almost mm -hmm. to the point of skeptical. All right. It, it really does show how the world is developing away from ads though. Like I know this is gonna be kind yeah. of a little bit off topic now, but it just ad ads being so intrusive, hence why you have other platforms like Patreon and stuff that you can support sure, channels yeah. and things like that, right? Because Whenever I'm on YouTube, I'm like, yeah, I have an ad blocker. I, I rely on ad revenue in order to survive as a as a broadcaster on YouTube. Exactly, but it's just like, it's a balance now, right? Because it's like, uh -huh. is this ad gonna try to sell me or Try to infect my Try to trick now. you into getting an infection of ransomware. Yeah, so it's yeah. just like I want to support small businesses and channels and stuff, but how do I balance that with safety now? Yeah. It's it's such a hard thing to talk it's about. It's a very good question. I don't know that there's an answer immediately sitting there ready to be given. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really just down to be very cautious, be skeptical when you're clicking on stuff online, mm -hmm. and know that even in somewhere like Google, maybe the yeah. ads contain malware. So watch out and be careful. Inventor of the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee is having another crack at fixing the Internet's biggest problems with the launch of a new enterprise server. The Inrup Enterprise Solid Server is the first product from a company the inventor started two years ago in response to the problem of personal data online, where tech giants like Facebook and Google build vast databases on users' profiles and sell them to advertisers to make massive profits. Inrup has worked on a series of new standards that allow individuals to store their personal information in pods whose access they control. The decentralized approach allows for the free and fast sharing of data, but with control in the hands of its owners. The project is called Solid, and after two years of work at MIT, the team behind it has released an enterprise service, the goal being to move the whole idea from concept to reality. The enterprise server will allow organizations to build applications using others' data pods that can do useful things like draw comparisons across users or build greater context around user data while keeping the user in control of their data. For many businesses, it will be a chicken and egg conundrum where it won't be worth investing in the solid system until there is sufficient data and users of the system. And users won't bother providing their data until there are sufficient companies and applications. With new regulations like GDPR and California's privacy law, a system like Solid would make it significantly easier, easier for companies to gather and use data without having the weight of administering it at all and being responsible for constantly updated permissions. In a blog post Monday, Berners-Lee announced the numbers of big-name partners that will run pilots, including the BBC, NatWest Bank, the National Health Service, and Flanders Government. The pilots are small, and the intent is to spark greater awareness of the technology and grow adoption. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom.
Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson.